This is going to be a walkthrough of basic cardiac anatomy using the CAE Vimetix ultrasound simulator. I'm going to use this simulated ultrasound wand on the left that is normally used to learn ultrasound techniques, except here instead we'll be using it to explore the anatomy of the 3D heart model. What we'll do is simply follow the path of the blood through the heart and discuss the major anatomical features that we see and also explain just a little bit of their function. We're going to begin here on the patient's right side where our features are mostly involved in the return of deoxygenated blood back to the heart. We're going to take a look at the superior and inferior vena cava, the right atrium, the right atrial appendage, and then we'll follow the path of the great cardiac vein and see its output into the right atrium called the coronary sinus. So we can see as we move our slice, it's going to move into the superior vena cava here. This is what returns deoxygenated blood from the upper half of the body into the right atrium. We're going to move back a little into the inferior vena cava. This is the inside of the right atrium, and this is the right atrial appendage here. This is mostly known for poor blood flow and causing clots and infection. Um, now we can see here the opening of the coronary sinus, and we're going to uh, follow this around as we see where the outflow of the great cardiac vein begins. Now we're going to take a look at the rest of the right-sided features, starting back with the right atrium. The features we're going to examine here are the, the right ventricle, the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles, the pulmonary or pulmonic valve, and then the pulmonary arteries. I'm going to play a few frames here. And the first thing I want you to notice is the difference in thickness between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. You can see pretty clearly here that the left ventricle is much thicker than the right ventricle. And this difference exists because of the different jobs that the ventricles have to do. The, the right ventricle has to pump blood uh, just through the pulmonary circulation to the lungs and then back to the left atrium, whereas the left ventricle has to pump blood throughout the entire rest of the systemic circulation, and it thus has to generate a lot more pressure in order to do that. I also want to point out a couple of other features here, uh, namely the, the chordae tendinae uh, that connect the papillary muscles to the valve leaflets. These, uh, these chordae tendinae, these little things right here, are actually the only connections that keep the valve leaflets from blowing back or prolapsing uh, back into the right atrium. When the right ventricle contracts, there's a lot of force. It generates a lot of pressure that pushes the blood through the pulmonic valve that's about right here. And the valve leaflets have to be restrained by something. And so each valve leaflet in both of the ventricles has its own papillary muscles, which is connected to it by these little chordae tendinae. Uh, I just remember the, the mnemonic papillaries prevent prolapse. So we're going to advance the video a little bit here. And so we can take a look at the tricuspid valve and see it open and close for a few beats. Just a couple more here, and I'm going to stop it. There we go. So we can see it stopped, and we can also see right there that the pulmonic valve is starting to open. Uh, so, so you can see the one, two, and then three valve leaflets that form that are attached to the chordae tendinae that restrain them and allow them to form that tight junction that you see, this tight junction here, which is what contains all the force of that right ventricle's contraction. We can also see that the uh, pulmonary or the pulmonic valve is starting to open right here, uh, and this is because the force of that right ventricular contraction has created enough pressure to overcome the force of the blood that's on this side of the valve that's already in the pulmonary artery. So that the pressure here has increased, and now the blood is going to flow through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary arteries, which are the, uh, the right pulmonary artery and the somewhat, somewhat sm shorter and smaller left pulmonary artery. So here they're going to deliver deoxygenated blood to the lungs, and this blood is then going to flow through the capillaries and pick up oxygen, and then it's going to pass back to uh, into these pulmonary veins uh, back to go back to the heart and enter the left atrium. Now we are moving on to the heart's left-sided features, which include the pulmonary veins, the left atrium, the mitral valve and its anterior and posterior papillary muscles, the left ventricle, the interventricular septum, the aortic vestibule and aortic valve, along with the aorta itself, and its ascending segment, arch, and descending segment. So I'm going to play a couple of seconds of video here, and then I'm going to pause it. There we go. 
So here we can take a look at the pulmonary veins. These are what return oxygenated blood from the lungs and deliver it to the left atrium. You can see here that the left atrium is actually kind of a different shape than the right atrium, whereas the ventricles, though they're different in strength and output, have a pretty similar shape. This is partly because the atria mostly just collect blood and don't actually have to pump very hard in order to get blood into the ventricles. Most of the uh, filling of the ventricles is actually done by the negative pressure that they create when they are opening up and expanding in diastole. Now I'm going to play a few more frames. There we go. So you can see here where I've stopped that the mitral valve has two leaflets. Uh, again, unlike the right atrioventricular valve or tricuspid valve, which has three, each leaflet here, uh, both the anterior and the posterior, has its respective papillary muscle connected by multiple chordae tendinae uh, that help restrain it during systole. So when the ventricle contracts, the blood does not leak back out. So. As a, as a quick clinical aside, if you ever hear the term mitral regurgitation, this refers to the case where the mitral valve has been damaged or is otherwise compromised in some way, such that during systole or contraction, some of the blood is, like I said, able to leak through the valve leaflets back into the left atrium because it doesn't form a tight junction. I also want to quickly note the intraventricular septum. The edges of the interventricular septum are where the Purkinje fibers run. These fibers are what carry the electrical impulse that causes contraction uh, that actually originated here in the cells of the sinoatrial node. That sinoatrial node propagates the impulse through the atria into the atrioventricular node through the bundle branch cells and the Purkinje cells out to the contractile myocardium, which is the muscle cells in the heart that actually contract in sequence so that the heart can do its job of pumping blood, which we'll see here. There we go. So that blood, now that it has oxygen, is being pumped out of the left ventricle uh, into here, into this space called the aortic vestibule. As the ventricle continues to contract, the pressure is going to keep building so that it can push open the aortic valve just like so. Here we go. The aortic valve here is the final barrier between the heart and the rest of the circulatory system. There we go. So that's it forming that barrier. It's a semilunar valve with three leaflets, very similar to the pulmonic valve, which we had seen earlier. And it's what separates the left ventricle from the systemic circulation. We'll watch as the aortic outflow uh, will go up and it's going to go through the ascending aorta over the aortic arch past three arteries and then back down through the descending aorta to the rest of the body. So that completes our overview of the path of the blood through the heart. I hope that was helpful. Thanks a lot.